Uh, as has been introduced, I'm going to reflect back on what we thought we knew 20 years ago and what we've learned since. I'm not going to be providing a lot of detail on the evidence for these statements, but there is a very long paper that I'll provide to Ross Bell and the organisers for people who want to know what sort of evidence it is I'm citing or, or using to support the claims I've made. I'll frame the, the discussion in terms of what we knew or thought we knew in 1993, what sort of evidence was around, what we concluded at the time about the probable health effects of cannabis, and then in each case look at what we've learned since about those. And I'll discuss at the end the concerns about what the likely effects of any increase in cannabis potency might, uh, what implications that might have for health effects, and very briefly reflect on what it is that we, we need to know. Back in 1993, the challenge we faced when we were commissioned by the Australian Government to look for the evidence was there wasn't much around. It was really fairly limited, it was quite old, and a lot of it was animal studies. That If you gave animals very large doses of THC and cannabis extract, uh, it had all sorts of effects on health, and the, there were a small number of laboratory studies uh, that had been done on largely college students, which sort of established that college students had fairly large appetites for cannabis if given unlimited access to it for between seven and 30 days. And there were limited numbers of case control studies comparing very heavy cannabis users with non-users. And at that stage, very few epidemiological studies, that is studies looking at representative samples of people who'd used cannabis and following them over time. It was also a challenge in that the evidence was fairly poor and the appraisals of that were driven by uh, policy perspectives that people had uh, adopted. Uh, it's like the, the old joke about uh, sort of philosophy being the finding of bad reasons for what we believe upon instinct, and there was a fair amount of that going on when it came to evaluating the evidence. There was also a sort of framing of the policy debate, which is still around, that either cannabis is harmless and should be legalised or it's harmful and should continue to be prohibited. Now that's obviously not, doesn't exhaust the choices and it comes to policy because we could still decide if that cannabis use is harmful and nonetheless that we might choose to regulate it in ways other than prohibiting it. But that, that framing of debate has, has meant that uh, evidence on health effects has been uh, appraised and refracted through people's pre-existing views. So people who've supported a retention of the status quo policy have typically emphasised the harms uh, to users, whereas people who are in a, uh, advocates of reform uh, tend to emphasise the social consequences, as has been mentioned in the introduction, of criminalising cannabis and its effects on young people who are caught up in the criminal law. Clearly, policy has to take account of both of those, and that's the task, usually, of government to come up with some consensus position that does justice to the harms that arise from cannabis use and the harms that arise for attempts to control it. The aims of our 1993 review were to identify probable adverse effects of cannabis, particularly the effects of acute use, meaning the effects that might arise on a single occasion of use or infrequent use, and the effects that might arise from chronic, e.g. particularly daily use over reasonable periods of time. We're also interested in identifying possible adverse effects that might be deserving of further study, and we wanted to identify high-risk groups who might uh, experience some of these adverse effects and we were also charged with providing some sort of advice to current users on ways of reducing the harms. We at the time, because the evidence was base was fairly poor, decided that we'd draw inferences on the balance of probabilities, meaning that we'd identify probable adverse effects where we thought there was reasonable evidence that it, uh, there's, there's a potential relationship and we didn't insist on uh, proof beyond reasonable doubt because we would have had a very short review and we would have had to give the money back to government. The criteria we used in deciding whether cannabis might be causally related to adverse health effects were fairly traditional. We wanted evidence that cannabis use and the adverse health effect were related or associated. We wanted to be clear on which came first, the cannabis use or the adverse health effect. Uh, so we wanted to rule out things like self-medication use of cannabis, for example, that people might engage in. And we w were looking for, where possible, longitudinal studies that were ena enabled us to distinguish the effects of cannabis from other drug use, that heavy cannabis users typically tend not only to use cannabis, but to be heavier consumers of alcohol, tobacco, and other illicit drugs, including stimulants. And also to attempt to tease out the contribution of the characteristics 
of cannabis users because the people who get involved in heavy cannabis use are not a random sample of the population. They typically tend to have various sorts of social and psychological attributes that put them at increased risk of a lot of adverse outcomes. So teasing out the effects of cannabis from the effects of pre-existing risk is a challenge. And we looked, we engaged in comparative assessments of asking the question, well, how, how well does the evidence on cannabis compare with the sort of evidence that we're prepared to accept for the harm caused by other drugs, e.g. alcohol and tobacco? And we also asked, reasonably enough, what might we expect to see from cannabis given its similarities to tobacco, e.g. it's smoked, and the fact that people use it for a lot of the same reasons they drink alcohol, to get high, to uh, feel good, to socialise and enjoy the company of others. Well, what's changed in 20 years, very, very briefly, is that we've got a lot more uh, longitudinal epidemiological evidence, uh, longer cohort studies of longer use careers, and more representative samples of the population, and in samples where there's higher rates of cannabis exposure, so we can look at possible dose-response relationships between extent of involvement of cannabis and these adverse effects. And in the, the, the better of these studies, with substantial proportions of the sample, have engaged in regular cannabis use for reasonable periods of time. We've also got much better measurement of a lot of health outcomes and the better studies have enabled us to control for potential confounders. And you're probably well aware of the fact that some of the most informative such studies have in fact been done here in New Zealand in the two birth cohorts in Christchurch and Dunedin. And these, sort of these studies uh, uh, over time have uh, produced very interesting results that I think have inspired similar studies in Australia and elsewhere that have largely replicated the results of uh, uh, New Zealand studies. So if we move on to acute health effects, we can be fairly brief about this. Uh, this is probably the one area where we were reasonably knowledgeable back in 1993, and that's because the acute health effects of cannabis use are, are not particularly startling. There's low toxicity, that is, it's, there are no, no, no reported fatal overdoses from cannabis. But people can experience pretty unpleasant uh, anxiety, dysphoria, panic, uh, particularly amongst naive users. And it's a, st a substantial proportion of first-time users have unpleasant experiences, which is a fairly strong motive for not persisting in use. And there's interesting work uh, that's been done here by David Ferguson and uh, elsewhere by Michael Linsky, suggesting that there may well be genetic bases for whether we find the effects of this drug rewarding or unpleasant. It's also un, uh, very clear that it impairs cognitive and psychomotor performance uh, in the short term, and at the time we were potentially uh, interested in a potential increase in accident, accidents uh, if people drove or uh, operated machinery and did other things while intoxicated. And there was reasonable evidence at that time, again, mostly case study evidence, that very high doses of THC could produce psychotic symptoms of short duration. Not a lot's changed uh, since in, in the last 20 years. There's some suggestive evidence from the increased mentions of uh, marijuana in emergency departments in the US that there may be uh, more adverse effects, particularly amongst naive users. And there's been some concern, which I'll come back to later, that the characteristics of contemporary cannabis with higher rates, uh, higher levels of THC and reduced levels of uh, cannabidiol, CBD, and may be contributing to people having more unpleasant experiences. But there's still debate about that. We look at accidental injury. Back in 1993, we had lots of laboratory evidence that performance on tasks relevant to driving was impaired in a dose-response way. Uh, there was the complication that people who'd smoked cannabis in laboratory tests were much more aware of the fact that they were impaired than were people impaired by alcohol and so uh, tended to reduce uh, risky behaviour, engage in compensatory behaviour change that might have reduced the likelihood of uh, adverse events. But it was clear even then that if people were put in to simulated emergency situations, then their response to those emergencies was impaired. There were also problems with the very limited epidem epidemiological evidence at that time that we didn't have good measures of uh, cannabis use uh, or well, we could measure whether people had had cannabis, used cannabis at some time in the last uh, several days to weeks, but we didn't have good measures related to degree of impairment. There was no definition at that point of per se uh, definition of impairment for cannabis. 
And in a lot of the studies, cannabis use was uh, confounded by alcohol, so it really wasn't clear uh, whether it contributed to accident risk. I think the story is much clearer now uh, as a result of better epidemiological studies of fatalities in uh, numerous countries, larger samples, better measurements of recent cannabis use, and better control for confounding the effects of alcohol. There's also studies that have been done here and in Canada showing that people who report uh, regular cannabis use also report higher rates of accident involvement. And there's been recently a series of meta-analyses of the epidemiological literature suggesting that the relative risk of involvement in an accident if people have recently used cannabis is roughly doubled. Uh, the risk is, is increased uh, several times more if they also have, have combined uh, cannabis uh, use with alcohol. The proportion of uh, accident fatalities estimated to be attributable to cannabis, the attributable risk in one French study it's a lot smaller than alcohol, as you'd expect, because there's a lot fewer people uh, drinking uh, after using cannabis than after uh, driving after using cannabis than after drinking in France. And the relative risk is smaller than comparable doses of alcohol, but it is clearly a factor and it's a public health issue that needs to be addressed uh, regardless of what our policy towards cannabis is. If we look at the area, I think, where the greatest community concern was back in 1993 and it continues to now, what are the, the effects of chronic cannabis use, particularly on young people who might initiate in their teens and continue to use throughout their 20s? What do we mean by chronic cannabis use? Or well, what I'm talking about here is the, the pattern of use that's most clearly related to these sorts of adverse psychosocial outcomes is daily or very near daily use, typically over periods of months, very often years, and in, in, as we'll see briefly later in the Dunedin cohort, uh, there are a minority of users who continue to use right through their 20s and into their 30s. So what are the adverse effects of most concern here? And I'll go through each of these in, in turn, uh, are listed there starting with dependence. Back in 1993, the evidence on cannabis dependence was fairly scant. It was a diagnosis included in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, third revision, the old DSM-3. Um, it was diagnosed, it was common, the most common form of drug dependence in US mental health surveys that had been done in the late the 1980s and early 1990s, the Epidemiologic Catchment Area Study. But it wasn't clear how serious a problem this was. Uh, in these surveys, typically people who met criteria for cannabis dependence didn't see themselves as having a problem. And at that point, treatment services weren't seeing many people uh, turning up saying, I've got a problem, a problem with cannabis, I need help. Uh, so it, there were plenty of debates at the time sort of saying, well, you know, it exists in the Diagnostic a Statistical Manual, but it's not really a big deal and we shouldn't uh, beat it up as a problem. And the, the part of our review, I think, that met with the most scepticism was the finding on cannabis dependence that time. Well, I think what's most clearly changed is, I don't think you can take the view that cannabis dependence is a figment of the uh, imagination of the uh, committees that designed the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Epidemiological studies have been done in a variety of countries reporting similar sorts of prevalence uh, uh, in the population. Uh, both in the US and in Australia and also here in New Zealand. But the, the thing that's clearest is there's a lot more users seeking help uh, for cannabis as a primary uh, drug problem. And in Australia now, cannabis is second only to alcohol as the reason that people seek treatment in addiction services. The same is true across the EU and most interestingly of all in the Netherlands. Because the, this sort of evidence is often dismissed as saying, well, it's an artifact of criminalisation in that people wouldn't be presenting to treatment if they weren't forced to by courts. Well, that's not the case in the Netherlands, but exactly the same phenomenon there where cannabis has been decriminalised. Uh, large numbers of people are seeking help for treatment uh, cannabis as a, a primary problem. And if you add it as a secondary problem, as it, as it is for a lot of people in Australian treatment services, it's, it's getting up there with, with alcohol. There's not a lot to choose between it. It's also clear from treatment studies, and you'll hear more about this during the remainder of the conference, that we can, uh, cognitive behavioural therapy is useful and there are treatments that assist people, but a lot of people do find it difficult to stop and to stay stopped. And the outcomes we see in treatment for cannabis dependence look a lot like 
the outcomes we see in treatment for alcohol dependence. So I think it's, it's a lot clearer that there is uh, an issue here and it's the problem of cannabis dependence, I think, as we'll see, that's the pattern of use that's most consistently associated with a lot of the other adverse psychosocial outcomes that people are concerned about. Well, what do the risks look like? The risks of developing dependence on cannabis back in the early 1990s in the National Comorbidity Survey, it was about 9% of people who'd ever used cannabis, roughly one in 10, who met criteria for uh, cannabis dependence. So that compares to around 15% for alcohol and cocaine at that time, and it's a lot less than comparable risks for opiates, which were about one in uh, three, and uh, for tobacco, which I think was, uh, uh, sorry, one in four for opiates, I think it was one in three for tobacco. The risk is higher if people start earlier, and in the longitudinal studies here, uh, in, in uh, Christchurch and Dunedin, if people initiate in their uh, early adolescence, sort of around the 15, 16 uh, year mark, they're much more likely to get involved in this heavy pattern of use. And the risk there is, is more like one in six. And if people have a history of daily use, the risk goes up fairly substantially depending on a study somewhere between a third and a half of people who've ever had a history of daily use and meet criteria for dependence. It's quite clear that the sorts of problems that bring people to treatment for cannabis dependence are not as severe as the sort of health problems that you see in people with heavy alcohol dependence or opiate dependence, uh, but they nonetheless are problems that people bring uh, to treatment. The clearest health consequences often respiratory symptoms from regular smoking, people report impaired memory and cognitive performance and that flowing into work performance. And then there are the usual sorts of social drivers of treatment seeking, the partner who disapproves of the fact that there's an absent partner who's never around, who's sort of stoned in front of the television and who's consuming up to 25% of the family income uh, paying for their cannabis use. So, those are the sorts of things that uh, it often bring people into treatment. The other big issue that's peren the perennial in the cannabis policy debate is whether it's a gateway drug. You can start with you know, the empirical evidence is very clear that there's a common sequence of drug involvement as there was clear in 1993 that alcohol and tobacco uh, use typically precede cannabis use and cannabis use typically precedes involvement with heroin and other illicit drugs. It's equally clear that only a minority of cannabis users go on to use harder drugs and typically in uh, the better studies less than 5% of cannabis users do go on to use harder drugs. But it's equally clear what minority of cannabis users are, what the characteristics are of that uh, minority who do. And it's clearly those people who get involved early who become regular users and persist in using uh, regularly. Back in 1993, all this evidence was largely from cross-sectional surveys. We didn't have, uh, and it was all based on retrospective reports of when people initiated and poor control of confounding. In 20 years since then, there's been a lot more prospective evidence, again, including some of the best from the uh, Christchurch study demonstrating a strong gateway pattern that remains strong and consistent, the temporal ordering, and the fact that early initiation and regular use is the strongest predictor of, of moving on to the use of other illicit drugs. But it's also clear from these studies that these, this pattern of use is partially but not wholly explained by uh, common causes, meaning that there's a selective recruitment of people into regular cannabis use who are more likely probably to engage in a variety of other uh, sort of uh, socially disapproved of behaviours. There's likely to be genetic vulnerability and there's clearly support for causal roles of peer affiliation and greater access via drug markets. You spend most of your time hanging around with peers who are also daily cannabis users. You don't have an income. It's easier for you to drift into drug dealing to finance your own use, which increases your access to and contact with people marketing other illicit drugs. Uh, what's less certain is whether there's some sort of direct effect of cannabis on brain function that might increase the likelihood of this happening. There's suggestive animal evidence, but uh, you know, a lot of debate still about that in the case of, uh, of humans. Educational performance was the other area of, of major concern. Um, back in 1993, it was clear that there was a, an association cross-sectionally. If you took a survey of 
of high school kids in the US, most of this was US data at the time. Those involved in cannabis typically perform more poorly at school and were more likely to be absent and more likely to leave school early. But it was unclear which was cause and which was effect. Was it that poor school performance were more likely to get involved in using cannabis? Did cannabis use impair school performance or equally was it more likely that both were true that poor performers got involved and smoking cannabis didn't improve things? In 2013, we, again, we've got lots of longitudinal studies, particularly from New Zealand and the US, showing that cannabis use, early use and regular use predicts increased likelihood of dropping out of school. In a recent study, David Fergus and others have published a meta-analysis of three Australasian studies has confirmed this association in a, in a dose response sort of way. It's equally clear that kids whose school performance is marginal to begin with are much more likely to use cannabis. They're much more likely to affiliate with other cannabis using peers. And the school system which sorts on ability tends to, I think Dave and Ferguson pointed this out many years ago, congregate these kids in the same classes. So unintentionally encourage the sort of affiliation between kids with these problems, uh, which is reinforcing. But I think it's equally clear that if your cognitive performance is a bit marginal, you're not doing well at school, and smoking dope every day is not going to improve things, and it's very likely to make things worse. The next topic, which no doubt be discussed in more detail later by uh, uh, Terry Moffat and uh, Nadia Solowy, cognitive impairment was a central focus because Nadia's involvement in the 1993 review and her, her doctoral thesis. The concern was, was understandable. Yeah, there was adolescents were very likely to get involved in using these drugs. Uh, early users were more likely to become heavy users. Poor school performances I've mentioned associated with uh, heavy use and we knew that chronic cannabis intoxication impairs learning. Um, it wasn't clear, though, from the studies at that point whether we were looking at persistent cognitive impairment in people who are heavy users or it was really the cognitive impairment effects of intoxication that we were studying. And it was also unclear at that point uh, how reversible these effects were. And Nadia's work at that time was, was some of the best control studies showing that there were subtle effects on attention in uh, laboratory studies that were related to duration and frequency of cannabis use. I won't go into what we've learned since because that, uh, that will be talked in more detail uh, about in the next session, but I think there are much more better case control studies showing more consistent findings in cognitive impairment in heavy long-term users. And there's also some support now from neuroimaging studies suggesting that daily use over 20 years uh, produces detectable uh, changes in uh, brain regions that are implicated in memory and cognitive performance. Clearly that's a minority pattern of use in people who might use cannabis daily over 15 to 20 years, but that's the pattern that uh, has come up and it's also been more recently reported in the Dunedin cohort study that very early cannabis initiators who smoked through their 20s into their 30s uh, had uh, on average a, a point lower IQ than peers who'd, who'd either started later or peers who discontinued use. That was about uh, just under 1% of the birth cohort from memory, so it's it's a minority of people who engage in levels of use heavy enough to produce this impairment, but it is uh, an issue of concern and will be discussed in more detail later. Cannabis use and schizophrenia, this was uh, a topic, and it's interesting the change in this. I remember giving a talk on this topic in 1993 to a school of psychiatry, and there was scorn and scepticism about the idea that cannabis might have anything at all to do with schizophrenia. Uh, and the views have, have radically changed within psychiatric profession in the last 20 years for reasons I'll explain. Back then, all we had largely was uh, a strong cross-sectional association in surveys between particularly heavy cannabis use or dependence and either psychotic symptoms or a diagnosis of schizophrenia. That was in clinical, in general population surveys such as the epidemiologic catchment area study. But it was also the case in clinical populations that the proportion of first episodes of psychosis reporting heavy cannabis use was about four times the estimated rate in the population, so it was elevated. There was also plenty of clinical reports that very heavy cannabis use exacerbated uh, 
uh, psychotic symptoms uh, in, in individuals with schizophrenia who continue to use it. But it was very unclear at that time whether this was some form of self-medication that might arguably make the disorder worse or whether the cannabis use might have played some contributory causal role in bringing on the schizophrenia. And at that point, there was only one large longitudinal study from Sweden, the Swedish conscript study, which suggested that uh, people, young men it was, it was only males, who'd reported any cannabis use at age 18 were roughly twice as likely to report or be diagnosed with schizophrenia over the subsequent uh, 15 to 20 years. And the heavier use, uh, users tended to have a much higher risk, a six-fold increase risk. But it was unclear at the time whether there'd been any change in schizophrenia prevalence that you might expect given the big increases in cannabis use that had occurred over that period. Well, since then, we've had a further follow-up of the Swedish cohort by uh, Zamet and colleagues, a 27-year follow-up of 50,000 young men. And this has provided uh, information on the association between cannabis use and psychosis over the, almost the full risk period for the development of uh, schizophrenia. Uh, much better registry cover coverage, much better statistical control for potential confounders. And they replicated the earlier findings with a slightly and somewhat increased relative risk, about threefold increased risk of diagnosis if people, uh, young men had reported cannabis use at age 18 and a dose-response relationship, meaning that the more often they'd used by that age, the higher the risk. The association persisted after statistical adjustment, uh, and it was true for the whole period, but the strength of the association weakened with time, as you might expect that it would. And they estimated the proportion of schizophrenia that could be attributed to cannabis use, assuming that the relationship was causal, was around about 13%. The results of the Swedish study have been supported by studies here in the, both New Zealand birth cohorts, in a Dutch cohort, and in a German cohort. Now, in each of these cases, they're usually looking at psychotic symptoms rather than the diagnosis of schizophrenia. But generally, they've tended to find the same sort of association, roughly a doubling of the likelihood of reporting uh, psychotic symptoms uh, amongst people who are heavy users. And the, Association was clearly strongest for the heavy use, particularly the daily pattern of, of use. The Dutch cohort attempted to simulate uh, a diagnosis of schizophrenia, and uh, it also found uh, the same sort of relationship over a shorter follow-up period. If we sort of summarise the evidence on that, uh, I haven't reported other studies, but there are studies more recently following up cohorts of young people diagnosed with schizophrenia and Generally, those who continue to use cannabis have a poorer outcome than those who uh, desist or stop. There's now consistent evidence, I think, from five longitudinal studies in three countries uh, indicating an association between uh, heavy cannabis use and an increased likelihood of being receiving a diagnosis of schizophrenia. And there's increased uh, evidence for the biological plausibility that very heavy cannabis use might uh, act on brain function in ways that produce the sort of psychotic symptoms that we've seen. And there's a small number of provocation studies showing that people with schizophrenia who are given THC under double-blind conditions, it does increase uh, psychotic symptoms. And Louisa Degenhardt and I have done a comparative analysis of the evidence, and arguably the evidence that cannabis has psychotic, psychotogenic effects is as strong, if not stronger, than the evidence that we typically tend to accept that heavy stimulant use and heavy alcohol use can also produce psychotic disorders. Cannabis depression and suicide is uh, an area that we didn't look at in great depth back in uh, the early 1990s. Uh, but since then, there's been quite a bit of evidence showing a, a weaker association between uh, cannabis, heavy cannabis use and depression, both in cross-sectional surveys and in the longitudinal studies done here in New Zealand. And in some studies, it's been correlated with higher suicide risks. But uh, studies typically tend to have limited statistical power to detect associations between cannabis use and suicide, which is still, a rel fortunately, a relatively rare event in cohort studies of around 1,000 people. So it, it's, it, the jury's still out, as it were, on what the associational relationship is between heavy cannabis use and depression. But I think there is a clear 
message for people involved in treating cannabis uh, dependence and also depression that there is fairly strong, often strong comorbidity between the two and people involved in treatment services for both should be screening for the other disorder and, and paying more attention to it. There's also emerging evidence in cannabis and other mental disorders. We, we certainly know that there are much higher rates of comorbidity between cannabis use disorders and bipolar disorder and anxiety disorders, but in, in these cases the uh, relationship that whether what, which is cause and which is effect is a lot less clear. Uh, and in, in a lot of these cases self-medication is still at least a partial explanation or plausible explanation of the association. But I think it's also likely that heavy cannabis use doesn't improve outcome in people who've got these disorders. So again, I think the lesson for uh, both mental health services and addiction services is to pay attention to diagnosing and treating these common forms of uh, comorbidity uh, in, in their clients. We turn to adverse health effects of chronic cannabis use and these are uh, less to do with mental health and psychosocial outcome and more to do with, with the health of the user. Uh, I'll, I'll talk briefly about these and, uh, and the evidence here as we'll see is, is still not as strong as it could be and that's for understandable reasons uh, in that we really, although we've had some 30 years of, uh, of study of reasonably regular cannabis use, even the longitudinal studies here are only looking at people into their early 30s. For looking at a lot of these health outcomes, we really need to be looking at people much older uh, who've smoked for longer. But I'll say something briefly about each of these. Uh, starting first with reproductive effects, this was a, an understandable concern back in 1993 because there was quite high rates of use amongst young women uh, during the childbirth uh, or the period in which they're likely to become pregnant or want to become pregnant. And there were uh, some studies reporting associations between regular cannabis use in pregnancy and adverse outcomes for the child. The most consistent of these has is, is really been low birth weight and prematurity. Uh, complication in interpreting that association has been uh, that we these studies have typically relied on self-reported cannabis use and there's obviously a fair amount of stigma around acknowledging that you're using drugs during pregnancy. But equally there's been problems around confounding that young women who use cannabis during pregnancy are also like, more likely to use other drugs such as alcohol and tobacco, come from low SES and, and have poor access to maternal care. There was concern back in the 80s uh, about birth defects uh, in uh, children born to women who smoked during uh, pregnancy. Not a lot of evidence has changed. There's, there's some large scale studies that fail to find that and there were also some studies mainly in Ontario uh, suggesting that offspring born to women who'd smoked cannabis during pregnancy suffered from cognitive impairment. Uh, I think there's still debate around the interpretation of these findings and we probably need better research on that and, and some studies are now underway in Australia recruiting new uh, samples of women that might provide that information. But clearly it would be prudent to be discouraging cannabis use during pregnancy uh, given uh, the evidence that we've got at the moment. Respiratory risks of cannabis smoking uh, were an obvious concern back in 1993. Uh, the drug was primarily smoked. We knew that the constituents of cannabis smoke were very similar to that of tobacco. And there were studies primarily from uh, a group at UCLA in, in uh, Los Angeles uh, finding increased rates of respiratory symptoms amongst very heavy cannabis users and suggestive evidence of histopathological changes in lung, particularly in people who smoke both marijuana and tobacco and impaired immunological responses and there are also studies suggesting that it impaired respiratory function. We've got much better evidence now but the, the story is, is still a, a little uh, confused and the evidence is a bit conflicting. Uh, there's no doubt that heavy cannabis users are more likely to report respiratory symptoms of cough, sputum, wheeze and there's some evidence from better uh, large-scale health utilization studies suggesting they're more likely to seek medical care for symptoms of respiratory disease. But the evidence on the impact of sustained heavy cannabis use on respiratory function is conflicting. There's some studies, including a study from the Dunedin cohort suggesting impairment of function. Uh, 
but there's been a more recent US study of long-term users that failed to find evidence of that. The other uncertainty is whether this risk can be reduced by changing method of use, and uh, there's some suggestive evidence of benefits from the use of vaporizers rather than smoking joints, but this is uh, so far fairly limited and it needs more research. Cannabis use and cancer. Um, I think it's way too early for the most part to be drawing strong conclusions either way on, on these, but I'll, I'll just briefly say something about the risks of these types of cancer that have been associated with cannabis use in various studies. Respiratory cancers were an obvious concern way back in 1993, given what we know about cannabis smoke and the sorts of observations I reported earlier. There are also reports in the medical literature of lung cancers being diagnosed in young adults who had uh, no history of cigarette smoking but had been heavy cannabis users. And there was some evidence that cannabis users, that there were mutational changes in lung tissue and cannabis smokers that similar to that found in cigarette smokers. But the epidemiological evidence, and there's quite a few studies now, that tended to be fairly mixed. Uh, case control studies comparing people who've developed lung cancer, rates of cannabis smoking amongst those and controls. Some have shown elevated uh, risks of lung cancer in smokers and others haven't. Uh, and there have been some uh, studies finding positive uh, associations between cannabis smoking and lung cancer risk. The problem in those studies has been that it's very rare to find a, someone who's only smoked cannabis. And so uh, disentangling the effects of cannabis smoking from tobacco smoking has been a, a challenge for these studies. There's a tendency, I think, to sort of draw the reassuring conclusion that we can uh, say that cannabis smoking doesn't cause cancer. I think that would be a mistake. Well, I don't think we've really had enough people smoking heavily enough for long enough for us to draw uh, strong conclusions on whether there's a risk of this sort. I'll say something briefly about childhood cancers. Back in uh, 1993, there were a series of case control studies of a variety of different sorts of uh, childhood cancer, finding associations between maternal reports of cannabis use during pregnancy and the likelihood of uh, these cancers. It, on the whole, none of these have been followed up, and I think that's because cannabis use wasn't the primary focus of these studies. It was one of a large number of variables measured as potential confounders uh, and found to be associated with it. So the chance of these associations being type 1 errors or, or chance results was, was reasonably high. And when we looked at trends in the incidence of these cancers, we didn't find any evidence that they'd increased, as you might expect, over the period when rates of cannabis use increased in uh, young women. Prostate cancer, there's one study, uh, a large cohort in the San Francisco Bay Area showing, a, a, I think it was a trebling of the risk of prostate cancer in men who'd reported uh, cannabis use. But the confounding's the most likely explanation of this association because it was done in the Bay Area and cannabis users also had an elevated mortality from AIDS. And I think in that population, cannabis use was highly correlated with being uh, a man who had sex with men, uh, and that's a risk factor for prostate cancer independently of cannabis use. Uh, as far as I know, there's been no other study looking at that particular issue. The surprise in preparing this talk was the last of these for testicular cancer. Um, there are in fact three case control studies, uh, all finding associations between regular cannabis use and a particular type of uh, testicular cancer in young men and the dose-response relationship, the risk increasing with frequency and duration of use. Uh, on the face of it, you'd think, what's cannabis smoking got to do with developing testicular cancer? Uh, the answer is that th there are cannabinoid receptors in testes, um, so it's not an utterly implausible association. And I think it's one that clearly deserves further study, given that we've got uh, one study reporting the initial association and then two studies designed as replications in fact, replicating the result. So it's unlikely to be due to chance whether it's a causal relationship or not, I guess, remains to be seen. Cardiovascular risks, uh, given that cannabis is smoked, it's, uh, smoking is not a desirable way to, to use a drug. We know that it can increase uh, uh, 
heart rate, uh, and THC is a, in fact a potent cardiovascular stimulant uh, acutely, and it has complex effects on blood pressure. Back in the early 90s, it was equally clear that young users who used the drug regularly developed tolerance to these effects, and so they largely disappeared. At the time, we were most concerned about potential impact of these risks on cardiovascular disease in older users because there'd been some studies showing that middle-aged men with a history of angina who smoke cannabis, it worsened their symptoms uh, uh, in the short term. And we're also concerned that older users who might be involved in using cannabis for medical reasons might be using intermittently and that this might increase the risk of uh, cardiovascular disease, particularly myocardial infarction. Uh, 20 years later, I think there's more reason for concern about this particular risk. We do have case reports of myocardial infarction and strokes in very young cannabis users who've been heavy consumers. It's quite likely that they've had undiscovered underlying cardiovascular disease that the cannabis uh, has exacerbated. And there are also many more older cannabis users than in, there were in 1993, so we've got some persisting uh, groovers hanging in there from my birth cohort are still doping up into their 50s and 60s and there's also uh, medical cannabis use amongst older adults, more of that. And there's suggestive evidence from a case crossover study indicating that uh, middle-aged men who'd had a myocardial infarction, that is a heart attack, were much more likely to report smoking cannabis in the hour before the event than uh, uh, at other comparable events. And there's uh, a longitudinal study of that same cohort showing that those who persisted in smoking cannabis over, I think it was a three year follow up, were much more likely to have another myocardial infarction and die. So that's a risk that middle aged and older cannabis users certainly should be made aware of. Cannabis potency, I'll say something about this as an issue. It's a, a, inevitably one that's Board up. It was of a concern back in 1993. Whoops. Uh, we looked at the data back then. There was very little data outside the US, um, and there was evidence that it had increased in the US between the early 1980s and 1990s. Uh, there was very little evidence in Australia at the time. In fact, there was marginally better evidence here in New Zealand suggesting that it hadn't really changed much over that period. But the other thing we noticed, and uh, which we thought was a more plausible explanation of increased rates of problems amongst younger users, because a lot of the motive for uh, indicting cannabis potency as a, as a factor was that younger people seemed to be getting into more difficulty with it. And so people said, well, maybe it's the product that's changed. But the other thing that we noticed was that the big change was the uh, earlier age of initiation and heavier rates of use in, in adolescence, which were, uh, we thought were the more likely explanation of increased rates of problem. Back then, there was a lot of debate about, well, if it had increased, so what? Maybe users titrate their doses uh, and hence uh, smoke less, and that would be a good thing. Uh, since then, uh, we've got a longer series of data. This is the US uh, uh, data on seizures and, and buys uh, of THC and marijuana and Cincinnati, the more potent product showing a fairly steady increase uh, in potency over that period. And we've seen further increases in THC potency more recently in Europe. Uh, and there's no surprise there. The markets for cannabis products are primarily catered to regular users who probably consume up of eight, upwards of 80% of the cannabis that's produced. They want more potent forms. That's what the market provides. The other concern that's more recently emerged has been whether uh, increased THC content in cannabis products has been accompanied by decline in levels of cannabidiol or CBD, uh, which many people suggest is a drug that moderates some of the adverse effects of cannabis. Uh, and surprisingly, that's the one area where we still are largely, uh, has been understudied, but it's still very weak evidence that cannabis users can titrate dose. And I guess the other question is, if they can, do they bother? Uh, and I think that's a, a question that we don't know the answer to. Uh, and I suspect, from given what we know about alcohol, people drink, they don't properly compensate for the potency. They're much more likely to get drunk on spirits than they are on wine or beer. And I suspect that similar sorts of things apply to uh, more potent cannabis products. <coughs> 
Well, what might it might mean if we, we've got much more potent cannabis out there? Well, I think we need to distinguish the potential effects on people who might be occasional users uh, from those who might be more regular users. And the occasional users, you might expect people to have more unpleasant experiences, and I've mentioned there's suggestive evidence of that from mentions of marijuana in emergency department attendances. That might have a desirable effect of encouraging more people to stop, but it also could potentially increase rates of uh, risks of accidental injury if people get behind the wheel of a car and drive. Among regular users, it could reduce the respiratory risk if they do in fact titrate their dose, but it could also potentially increase the risk of dependence if people aren't likely to do that, and particularly amongst uh, adolescent users. And it also could potentially increase uh, likelihood of uh, cognitive impairment. High risk groups, this is exactly the same list we put up in 1993, I don't think it's changed. Uh, adolescents very clearly a, a high risk group, particularly those who use early and we used early around 15 years and kids who already have problems at school, particularly those with conduct disorders, oppositional behaviour, they're really high risk at uh, getting involved in cannabis and getting involved early and heavily in cannabis. Pregnant women I think are still a, a group we should be advising about and clearly people with a variety of pre-existing health conditions that I've gone through, cardiovascular disease, respiratory disease, psychosis, and common mental disorders. I think people with anxiety and depression, uh, as with alcohol, are probably likely to get involved in self-medication and uh, more likely to drift into regular use in a miscarried attempt to deal with their sort of anxiety and depression. And clearly people with other forms of alcohol and drug dependence, you see a common sort of hope that uh, if people can switch from alcohol to cannabis, they'd be better off. Uh, maybe they are, but they're just as likely to become dependent on that drug as they are on alcohol. Uh, so I think those are the, the clear high-risk groups. Say something briefly about comparisons with tobacco and alcohol. Uh, the respiratory disease risks of cannabis uh, resemble some of those from tobacco, particularly around chronic bronchitis. Less clear for impaired lung function and emphysema probably because there are a lot fewer cannabis users who smoke every day uh, and throughout the day, as is the case with tobacco smokers. The cardiovascular disease risk, I think, is, is quite uh, is similar, at least acute effects, and I think that the mechanism's different here. It's more likely to occur when people use the drug acutely, uh, uh, less than the effects of chronic smoking, as is the case with uh, cigarette smoking. The cancer story let yet to be uh, sorted out, but uh, I think the issue there that's interesting, which is obviously different, there's, there's no reports that I'm aware of of increased risk of testicular cancer in tobacco smokers, but that's uh, clearly a risk that needs to be investigated. Compare it with alcohol. Uh, alcohol can kill you in overdose, and it does. Um, that's not a risk. This is well known uh, for cannabis. People have unpleasant experiences with cannabis as they do with alcohol. It's probably less well known that there are genetic bases for people having uh, unpleasant responses to alcohol as a substantial proportion of some populations, particularly Asian populations, who have a genetic uh, basis for developing nausea and vomiting if they consume alcohol. There are similar but less prevalent uh, sorts of genotypes in Caucasian communities as well. The main effect of this is to discourage you from continuing to use. Uh, the crash risk, uh, cannabis probably increases motor vehicle accident risk as does alcohol. The effects are probably not quite as pronounced uh, as comparable doses of alcohol, but the effects will increase if people combine the two as they very often do. I think the underappreciated risk and one that I've tended to emphasise in media comment on cannabis is the risk of dependence, which lots of younger users don't appreciate. Uh, I think in Australia over the last 10 years there's been decline in prevalence of cannabis use and I think one of the reasons for that has been uh, an increased recognition of uh, well, what's what, not, what is not described as cannabis dependence but a pattern of use that young people recognise and peers as one that's undesirable and that's the form of cannabis dependence we're talking about. And it's that pattern of use that we see a concentration of these adverse psychosocial outcomes and poorer mental health. So it's a pattern of use that we should be paying more attention to in our uh, 
efforts to prevent cannabis uh, use and harms and also to uh, improve our, our responses. What do we still need to know? I won't preempt. There's, there's going to be a lot more detailed discussion on that. But we, we certainly still need to know more about its adverse effects on adolescents and, and young adults, uh, although we're a lot better informed than we were 20 years ago. We still, uh, there's much to be learned about the adverse effects on physical health of long-term use, and we might be in a better position to make judgments about that in another 10 or 20 years. And we also need to be paying attention to the changes in cannabis products uh, to see what the impact uh, changes in uh, increases in THC content and declines in CBD content mean. And finally, we need to know more about better ways to reduce harms. We've introduced roadside drug testing in Australia and we don't really know yet what impact that's had uh, on uh, driving risk. We need to uh, do more research on better ways of treating people with cannabis dependence and that certainly includes the sorts of programs I know the Drug Foundation here is exploring with online outreach to young people who might be developing problems, getting to them early enough that they can uh, be assisted to uh, desist or reduce their use and problems. We need uh, better forms of intervention with young people who uh, develop psychotic disorders and depressive disorders who are cannabis users. And we need better ways of encouraging young adolescents who get involved in cannabis to um, avoid use preferably or increase cessation uh, if that's the case. And we also have plenty to do in looking at ways of reducing respiratory risks of uh, cannabis smoking. So thanks very much for your attention. I'll leave a bit of time for questions.